Good morning, this is Mindy with CAI Utah, I'm the Executive Director for the chapter, and we're just giving everyone a few minutes to log on as all the PowerPoint is running. We will be up and starting shortly, so welcome. Welcome to our webinar on uh, COVID-19 and legal ramifications. We have a great topic for you today. We are looking forward to sharing this presentation and we have some great panelists we'll introduce in a minute. Um, a, few, a few announcements. We'd like to give a thanks to our Diamond sponsors, Advanced Community Services and FCS Community Management. Um, our next event will be June 19th at 9 a.m. It will be another webinar that will be featuring FHA topics with another great um, selection panelist. So 
be sure to look on the website, uccai.net, and look under events and register for that one. We're going to give a good thank you to our um, sponsors for today. Our main event sponsor is FCS Community Management. And FCS Community Management proudly serves over 200 communities a lot across Utah and Idaho. FCS is an international leader among all management firms in community association management and is Utah's We lost you there for a second, Mindy. Hello? Am Hello. I on? There you are. Right now you are. All right. Thank you. My apologies. I had a caller. I had to click them off. All right. Back to our main sponsor. Our main sponsor is FCS Community Management, and they proudly serve over 200 communities across Utah and Idaho. FCS is an international leader among all management. We lost you again, Mindy. transition to working on Monday, March 16th, and have been recognized by AI National Department of Health for their efforts to provide guidance to associations for the reopening of common areas and amenities, as well as for holding association board and owner meetings virtually. We also have, we'd like to thank SCS for being our main sponsor. Our exhibit sponsor for, day, for today is SunWest Bank. And if you're looking for a bank that genuinely understands the HOA and property management industry inside and out, look no further than SunWest Bank. With over 40 years in the HOA lending space, we have products and services specifically designed to meet your community association's needs, including a variety of time and money saving options. Our Utah-based HOA banking team could work with you to not only pick cash management solutions that cover your complicated transaction and payment needs, but we can also help you secure financing for things like property renovations and short-term cash flow needs. Visit sunwestbank.com slash HOA to learn more or call Chad Cantor at 866-99-1835. So that includes our promos for our great sponsors. And now on our main event topic, which is COVID-19 and legal ramifications. Um, our presenters are Scott Welker, an attorney with Vile Fotheringham in Salt Lake. Robert Rosing, an attorney with Rona Law in Park City. Bruce Jenkins, attorney with Jenkins Bagley in Southern Utah. And our moderator will be Scott Anderson with SDS Community Management. And I will turn the remainder of our time over to Scott to give us a, um, a brief intro to how this presentation will work and to give the time to our panelists. Thanks, Scott Anderson. Thank you, Mindy. Uh, I'm excited for today. As Mindy mentioned, uh, we're talking about uh, COVID-19 and the legal ramifications and some of the considerations that um, managers are having to deal with as we're managing our associations. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to cover a myriad of topics um, from governing documents to maintenance issues and everything kind of in between. And so what we'll do is we'll have the panelists um, present um, a short five to uh, seven minute uh, presentation on each of those topics. If you have questions during those uh, topics, please put them into the chat and we will make sure to get the panelists to answer those questions and recap those questions. Uh, we look forward to presenting a hopefully useful um, webinar for everybody. But with uh, that, we will turn the time over to Scott Welker to get us started with some governing document considerations. <clears throat> okay, thanks. I'm gonna apologize. I feel like my um, my screen is or my camera is darker than everybody else's. My room, I guess, my lighting is not as good, so um, it gives me more of the five o'clock shadow uh, look, though, when everybody else is, has facial hair anyway. So, um, so the first first question that we had uh, that I'm presenting on is um, so during a pandemic. How do we handle governing, governing document enforcement? And specifically, how do you maintain rules without seeming punitive? Um, I'm going to take a little bit of issue with 
with the premise of this question and, and uh, start by saying I, I think that if if the priority that our boards if the thing that our boards are prioritizing is um, whether their their enforcement seems punitive and, and it has an appearance of being punitive then then they're probably starting from the wrong place um, I you know that's not to say of course we're all human and we're sensitive to, to the hardships people are having and and uh, we, we want to be sensitive. We don't want to look like jerks. Um, but you know, if you're asking an attorney from the from the legal uh, standpoint, that, that really doesn't play into a, a legal analysis. And if a board is is sued for you know breaching fiduciary duty, not following their government documents, et cetera, um, saying they didn't want to seem punitive isn't really going to provide a, a, a legal defense. So, so I my my first um, bit of, of counsel on this would be, well, let's actually first, before we, we talk about what the appearance of what we're doing is, let's first look at what, what are your actual legal duties for enforcing your governing documents, and are there exceptions that um, COVID-19 maybe present to those legal, to those legal duties? So um, I'd say first, let's look at fiduciary duties. And um, you know, this is one fiduciary duty um, that's articulated in state law. There, there are others, but I think that this might be the most relevant to this question and these circumstances, and it's, it's this. Utah state law says that, mm -hmm. that a board member has a legal duty to perform his or her duties in a manner he or she reasonably believes to be in the best interest of the, of the nonprofit corporation, or in this case of, of the HOA. Um, and so I think first you have to ask yourself a question, or the board has to ask the question is, um, you know, maybe homeowners are upset with us, maybe, maybe we're looking um, punitive, maybe they feel like we're being too harsh, but, but the real analysis is, are we doing what's in the best interest of the, of the association? Um, and, and I think that's going to be case by case. Um, you know, this is going to be really kind of fact sensitive. Um, analysis based on what, what specific violations are we talking about? What is your community? What's the nature of your community? Um, is in strict enforcement going to be in the best interest of your community on a case by case basis? But, but that, that's, I think, the, the standard that we need to keep in mind um, more than a, a concern about perception or, um, or, or anything similar to that. Um, fortunately, in Utah law, though, we don't have to look, we don't really have to ask the question of, you know, how do I make a judgment a call about when to not enforce? It's not really a, a gut feel thing so much um, because in Utah law we have some specific guidelines about when non-enforcement is appropriate. And um, let's look at that statute. So there's a statute that's that's both in the Community Association Act and the Condo Act. Um, it's it's the same in both. This should say 578A. I made a mistake there and put in 10A. So um, but, the, but there's a statute reference under both acts, and here's what it says. Um, after fair review and acting in good faith and without conflict of interest, um, the board can determine that that under the specific circumstances, um, it's not justified to take enforcement action. If they make that determination, and there's some other guidelines that will go into the next slide, then they might not be required to take enforcement action and they're not later prevented from taking enforcement action. But there's a standard in there that's pay attention to. You have to conduct fair, fair review, you have to be acting in good faith, and you have to be acting without conflict of interest. So again, some, some concrete standards that you can look to in state law, um, ask yourself those questions, those things are taking place, and then if you're following these guidelines which the statute then directs you to. Um, there's kind of four of them that I put in boxes here. I'm gonna. I'm going to focus on the one in the bottom right corner here. Um, one of the one of the criteria that a board can rely on under state law is they can say, well, it's not in the association's best interest to pursue enforcement action based upon hardship, expense, or other reasonable criteria. Um, to me, it's pretty obvious. Hardship or other reasonable criteria. I mean, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, so so I think you can certainly make a good argument that there's some hardship here. There might be um, reasonable criteria for not enforcing, um, but again, this this criteria is, still takes you back to: Are you acting in the association's best interest? So, I, I think I think in sum, I, I would say that that the the important thing to do here is 
you know, again, we're human. We want to we want to do what's right by our neighbors. But remember that there are legal obligations that the board has, and the legal obligations are pretty well defined under our law. And rely on those things um, more than anything else. Prioritize prioritize that. Scott, what's your uh, what is would your response be to someone that says I can't bring in my garbage can because I'm socially distancing from my neighbors? Um. Well, I mean, I gotta tell you, my knee-jerk reaction is that doesn't feel very valid. I mean, are you are you having to get within six six feet of your neighbors to bring your garbage can in? And and I think that's the kind of thing that that an HOA board can can deliberate on. You know, again, fair review is part of the standard for for the statute. And I think they can say, well, you know, let's enough, let's let's analyze the situation and say, is that something that we really should we should forego enforcement of right now um, because do our neighbors have to violate, um, you know, government regulations and mandates for regarding coronavirus in order to follow to follow this this guideline and or to follow this regulation? I think if the answer is no, we're not we're not requiring them to do anything unreasonable or in violation of, of guidelines or that really seems that any experts have said is going to put their health at risk. Then I think it's fine for the board to say, well, we're going to continue enforcing that that regulation then. So what you're saying is, is that we can, as managers, we can look at those rules that can be enforced at, while, um, like garbage cans, because there's not a danger there. But if we're looking at some of the other rules, uh, maybe trailers being out for first responders and choose not to enforce those and the law would support us. I think that's right. I mean, I, I think that it's the board who has the fiduciary duty. So obviously it's the board who should really be the one saying, well, we're going to deliberate on that. And but I think that's the guidance that they should be given is um, state law does say you can consider reasonable criteria for for postponing or, or, or not enforcing um, under certain circumstances. I, I think it's important in, in minutes and correspondence and everything else to be clear. That doesn't mean we're, we're, we're saying, you know, we're waiving this rule, it's not that it's no longer a rule, it's that we're not enforcing against it right now under these circumstances. Perfect, thank you. Um, are there, I haven't seen any questions come in, um, and so we will move on then to, um, to Bruce, who uh, will be talking about some common areas. Hey, so let me see if I can scroll down to the next set of slides. There we go. So, yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, maintenance, um, sanitation of indoor and outdoor common areas and what you should be doing or some good guidelines during the pandemic. So uh, I've got a series of slides. I'd tell you that much of this information, there's a company called First Service Residential. They uh, have a good website where I obtained a lot of this information from, but I think it's common sense, at least it is now during the pandemic. If you're cleaning, use gloves, disposable gloves, or disinfect what you have. Um, and I'm going to, in a minute, go through more detailed ones, but just in general, the routine cleaning, frequently clean the surfaces touched most often. Um, a high level of use, more cleaning. Lower level of use, less cleaning. Uh, if something's in a public place, make sure you take care of that and clean it. Uh, so soft surfaces, maybe maybe you already have this handled, but there's a different method for cleaning soft surfaces. You uh, use soap and water. You don't need to use some disinfectant. You launder, wash with soap and water your soft surfaces. If you choose to disinfect, you can. Uh, you can use some EPA registered household disinfectant, but uh, soft services just be laundered. Now, what if someone's sick? What if someone has the coronavirus and you've got to deal with it? The best thing you can do is close off the area that's being used by that sick person. You almost have to quarantine them in-house, if you will, if they can't be removed to be quarantined. Um, you don't have to close down the whole place. Obviously, if you're a high-rise condo, you can't shut down everything, but you have to try and quarantine that area. Open the windows, let the place air out. You, you don't want to keep these germs contained in a confined area. 
wait a period of time to go in and disinfect and after you disinfect. Make sure you use proper cleaning and disinfecting materials. Now, outdoor stuff. This is sometimes asked, well, what do I do with the outdoor things? It's not as big a concern outdoors, but it doesn't mean there is no concern. They suggest that there's no need to spray outdoor playground equipment with disinfectant. It doesn't seem to be helpful. If it's a high touch surface and it's a plastic or metal surface, it should be cleaned routinely, railings, um, grab bars, that sort of thing. If it's a wooden surface, again, disinfectant is not, the, the virus tends to survive more on um, the smoother wood, metal, glass surfaces than on a wooden surface. So they, they don't, don't necessarily recommend disinfecting wood surfaces. Sidewalks and roads, people aren't getting coronavirus from those. I guess if they lay down and lick the sidewalk, maybe, or pick up bubble gum off the sidewalk. But other than that, uh, you should be pretty good with your sidewalks and roads. Um, however, we'd recommend that you use signage in, in what I'll call high traffic or key areas, your entrances, reception desks. If you have, uh, again, high rises, uh, restrooms or clubhouses, if they are open with restrooms, elevators, fitness centers, all those places put up signs that would be commensurate with the level of, uh, like a, we're an orange level now, signage commensurate with that. If it's red level, the signage might reflect that. Um, and in all of those areas, it's a good idea to put up hand sanitizing stations or hand sanitizers so people who are coming coming in and out of the front area can sanitize at their front desk reception areas fitness centers all those places need regular cleaning and because hand sanitation is critical with COVID-19 hand sanitation machines we would recommend that you put those in place as well so um I sort of quickly scanned through indoor and outdoor cleaning, but Scott, if you have questions or anyone else has a question, I'm happy to answer. So um, looking at some of these in-house, um, like high-rise condos or even some other communities have in-house mail rooms. And in the grocery stores, you've seen the lines that kind of box out the six foot social distancing sort of spaces would it be advisable for hoas to mark those areas out also or is it is the signage appropriate the signage i think is useful but you still should have the spacing as well uh, think of it this way if you're at the grocery store and spacing is required it becomes a matter of public knowledge that spacing is a good idea if you then abandon that public knowledge inside your community and say oh it matters out there but doesn't matter here then i think that becomes a problem awesome um unless i am missing questions that nothing came up uh so we will uh move on to a maintenance consideration with robert um as we talk about maintenance sort of responsibilities okay and please let me know if, since I'm on the headset, if you can't hear me. Um, so we'll talk about uh, maintenance in the time of corona. And there are a few issues that, that I'm, I'm sort of addressing. One is the general maintenance. You have to go into someone's unit. You need to go into someone's unit in order to access the common area. Um, you need to go into someone's unit, and they refuse to let you in. Or, or my favorite, you need to go into someone's unit and you know that they have COVID-19. Um, we start from the proposition, I think, we can all, probably all agree that if it's not an emergency and it's something you can put off, it's probably best to do that. Um, there's a couple of reasons, maybe not, which I'll talk about at the end, but um, what I'm talking about now mostly is things that need to be done. So if it's an emergency, um, there's, there's a statute in the HOA Act and there's a statute in the Condominium Act that allow you to enter into a unit uh, in an emergency to make repair. Most 
uh, condominium documents have similar language. Some um, HOA documents um, have similar language, but uh, you can rely on the statute. Uh, so what's an emergency repair? The repair that is not timely made will likely result in immediate or substantial damage to common area or another lot or another unit. Um, and under these statutes, if you give reasonable notice, you know, you have the authority to enter into a unit even if someone doesn't want to let you in. Um, and the notice, uh, I think, needs to be reasonable under the circumstances. So if a pipe is flooding and, and, and is flooding a unit, notice might be banging on the door. Um, if it's something that you can give a couple days notice, my slide works. Um, sorry. Something you can give a couple days notice, the most notice possible or practical, I think, is, is the way to do it. Obviously, you want to follow all the guidelines, I think, that we've, we've all come to understand. You know, the minimum number of people, um, you want to screen maintenance people for symptoms before allowing them entry into a unit or, or onto a lot. Nobody who uh, has symptoms should be allowed. In fact, they shouldn't be working at all. Um, maintenance personnel should be required to wear, and I would say gloves, especially if you're going to someone's unit. If the unit owner is there, if they're sheltering in place or quarantining, um, ask them to wear a mask. If they don't have a mask, give them a mask. Um, and then require, you know, you know, per what Bruce said, you want to clean everything before you leave um, and maintain as much distance as possible uh, while you're in the in the lot or in the unit from the owners, um, and and then obviously try and maintain space from each other. So, if the owner, oops, my mouse is a little sensitive. If the owner uh, doesn't want to let you in, um, either because uh, they're just ornery, or because uh, more likely they're afraid, uh, with good reason. And then, and and it, uh, because of the pandemic, I mean, obviously you want to try and work with them um, as much as possible, and and let them know that you have the right to come in. Um, if they still refuse to allow you access, you know, I I believe you have two options. One is to use the statute and basically just go in. Um, is that wise? I think it depends on the owner and severity of the problem. You know, if if you think the owner has is infected, or if you think the owner might be dangerous, you know, uh, in Park City, I've gone into court and asked for a TRO. Um, I find, uh, I don't know if the other attorneys would agree, that uh, when you're asking for a TRO and it's a true emergency, you're likely to get it. Um, and then if you need um, sheriff or police support, you can get it. Um, if it's truly um, not an immediate emergency, but common area needs to be fixed, which is the other basis for using these statutes to get into a unit, the common area needs to be fixed. You may not uh, get a TRO, but you can get a preliminary injunction. If you get as an order of the court, that would allow you to go into the unit. Um, and you can be more targeted in, in going into the unit. If the issue the only, uh, is that you don't feel safe. Um, you know, we've had it come up in Park City, as many of you probably know, uh, was an early epicenter of the virus. And there were some questions, um, if we think someone has it or if we know somebody has it, you know, are there more precautions we can take? And the short answer is yes. Um, you know, if you really think a unit is, is dangerous and that and you want to do more than the normal precautions, um, basically, you can hire, you know, UD, UDK, you know, Utah Disaster Cleanup, or a similar company, who will come in and have mat suits and disinfect the unit. Um, I think that's probably uh, overkill for most situations. Um, but if you have people who are extremely worried or you know compromised, you know that option exists. Um, they will come in and they will clean the unit, and then you can go do your work. Um, in terms of what guidelines you should be following more generally, um, I'm going to talk about the orange level guidelines for a second. This goes into my next topic, which is how do you reopen the, 
clubhouse and other amenities in the gym. Uh, this is something I've been debating uh, in my own HOA. And the first question I had was, are the, are the guidelines, the phase guidelines that we all probably have looked at, are they guidelines or are they requirements? And um, I don't know if, if the governor is, is purposefully making that murky, uh, because I think the answer is that the requirements. Uh, but I, don't, but I, I think there could be some uh, interest in avoiding crowds by uh, making it seem like they're guidelines. If you look at the ordinance or the order issued by the governor, it cites the Utah Code Section 53, 2A, 201, 204, 209. This is the Disaster Response and Recovery Act. And that statute says that in a disaster, the governor's orders have the full force and effect of law. And if you look at the proclamation itself, it says that individuals and businesses shall comply with the phase guidelines. The only exception to that in the order um, and again, this is why I think perhaps uh, the governor is being purposefully murky, although maybe not, is that the requirements to wear a face mask are requirements in the business setting, but uh, for individuals, they are merely strong recommendations in the non-business setting. So that's the only exception. If you look at the phase guideline FAQ on the governor's website, or uh, the state's website, it says that business and, businesses and individuals must comply and that the guidelines are, in fact, just minimums, that you can go beyond the guidelines, um, and maybe that's the justification for calling them guidelines as opposed to calling them requirements, is that they're supposed to set a floor, not a ceiling, um, which leaves the question of if they are requirements, let's talk about gyms for a second, do they apply to HOA gyms? The argument being, well, an HOA gym is not really a business. It's owned by the association or the owners. Um, is it more like the gym you have in your house, the gym you have in your basement? I called the state to ask them this question, and they won't give me an answer. Um, and they have said, well, call your local health department. I've called the local health department, uh, and they won't return my phone calls. So um, it seems to me that a gym in a, in a, in a complex, uh, in a building, is more like a commercial gym. It's got multiple people using it um, than an individual gym in a home. Yes? You may want to advance the slides. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to get to the, the, to the, uh, the requirements in a second. Um, but the upshot, and I'll talk about, I don't want to spend too much time, is that uh, I believe the safe position to take is that the phase guidelines do, approach, do apply to HOAs, um, they apply to uh, construction when you're you know, doing construction in an HOA, and they apply to the gym and the clubhouse, um, and that they have the force of law. And uh, if you look at the FAQ, it says that they can be enforced. Um, by the health department, and uh, the other way that they can be enforced, I think that that could that could become an issue, is lawsuits. Um, and I'll talk. So I don't know if anybody saw there was an article in KSL on Wednesday, I think, that said the contact tracers in Salt Lake City had traced 70 cases of coronavirus to two businesses that had not followed the guidelines. Um, and we all know, we probably heard the term contact tracing, we know that's coming uh, to the extent it's not already being done. And so there's a, there's a good chance, especially as we move on, that people will be able to trace where they got the coronavirus. Um, and so if you get the coronavirus from someone who's not following the rules, and you get sick or you die, is there going to be a lawsuit? Um, I don't know. I think it's very likely. Uh, which leads me to my last thing, and then I'll talk, which, which is all the subtext or the, the background for opening the clubhouse is uh, the recently passed statute SB 3007, which is an attempt by the Utah legislature to immunize 
uh, businesses, and in this case, you know, homeowners associations, from liability for damages from coronavirus. Uh, if somebody dies or somebody gets injured. The problem is, and I, I put this on the slide, I'm not sure this statute does what they think it does. The statute says, a person is immune from civil liability for damages or an injury resulting from exposure of the individual to COVID-19 on the premises, owned or operated by a person during an activity managed by the person. That sounds good from a, from a not being sued perspective. It does not apply, however, to willful misconduct or reckless infliction of harm. And so the issue is then, if you're operating a gym in a, in a homeowners association, the governor has issued phase guidelines that have the force of law, and you know that there is no chance you can meet those guidelines, and you nonetheless open the gym, and somebody gets sick, have you acted willfully? Have you knowingly violated the law? Oftentimes, uh, violating the law gives rise to a claim for what's called negligence per se. You don't even have to prove that you're negligent. Now, I don't want to, willful misconduct is a higher standard of negligence. I don't want to bore everyone with um, too much legal discussion, but uh, I'm, very, I'm very worried. My own homeowners association, other associations around us, um, are they opening their gyms? Should they be opening their gyms? Because the requirements for opening a gym or a clubhouse under the orange uh, moderate risk phase are pretty strict. Clubhouses and common areas may be open uh, with social distancing, face coverings, increased cleaning and sanitation. Um, and if, you, if the clubhouse is staffed, that's doable, probably. Um, if you have a cleaning service that comes regularly, you know, you, you can, you can um, meet those requirements. I think when it comes to a, other facilities like a gym, it becomes much harder, um, especially because there are specific requirements for gyms in the phase guidelines. And those uh, requirements assume you have staff. Uh, I don't see how a gym that's unstaffed can, can possibly meet the requirements. You have to screen patrons. Uh, there have to be face coverings. You have to have 10 feet of distance at all times, um, which may require limiting the number of patrons in the facility. Um, and equipment must be disinfected after each use. Uh, can an HOA gym meet these requirements? Probably not. Um, so that, again, that gets back to the question of, is an HOA gym a business subject to these rules? And the conservative uh, attorney in me, conservative little c, says, I don't want to risk it. Um, I know everybody, want, you know everybody wants the gym to be reopened, um, but I'm very nervous about opening gyms, and um, you know, I'd be happy to someone to tell me that I'm wrong. But my recommendation right now is that you not open your HOA gym unless you can meet these rules. Um, so that's, I think that's it for gyms. Perfect. So we will um, quickly move on to pools and spas and talk about that because I think that we are um um well we'll we'll talk about that and then we'll answer a couple of questions that have come up because I think that they will pertain to both the clubhouses and the pools. Scott? Okay. Yeah so I'll take um I'm taking pools. Let me see if I can get this to go. Oops. Okay well that's fine. Um so I, I agree with, with with a lot of what Robert has said. To me, the uh, the question uh, or, or where the the guidelines that the state has has issued um, are most relevant. I, I'm not really all that concerned with with whether the state can enforce them against the HOA. I mean, I mean, I, I guess that, that certainly could become an issue in some cases. It doesn't seem to be something they're actively doing right now. But I think that right now where the rubber heats meets the road is, is a little bit more on um, what Robert hit on is is um, how does that play into lawsuits? Um, so again, I'm going to go to back to fiduciary duties. Um, it's what we call the, the duty of care, and it's it's um, codified in Utah law, and it says that a board has has the duty to perform their duties with the care an ordinary prudent person 
in a like position you would exercise under similar circumstances. So what would an ordinarily prudent person do um, who has who has control over a pool that's that could be accessed by you know several homeowners? Um, certainly an injured party, somebody who's claiming that they got coronavirus from from your pool, could make a strong argument that that the prudent thing to do would have been to not open that pool unless you're following state guidelines, regardless of whether those guidelines are actually um, enforceable against the HOA by the state. I think that they that the defendant can make a strong argument that that's that's the standard of care that that the HOA should have been following. And and I have the same concerns as Robert when you look at the guidelines. Um, and I think I have them on the next slide here. There we go. And, and this is kind of a summary of the guidelines and Robert went, went over them in a little bit more specificity. But you look at the guidelines, I agree, it's, it's difficult I think for most associations to, um, to, to meet these without being having some kind of staff who's there to enforce them. So, you know, things like is, is uh, if there's lap swimming, is it only one lane at a time? Or the guidelines also say if you don't have lanes, then um, then, then you need to be keeping the pool at 50% of capacity. No congregating on the decks. Um, it should be screening for symptoms um, and maintaining signs. I, the the more spe specific guidelines do talk about putting um, signs on the floor and that sort of thing, or markings on the floor to make sure that people are staying six feet apart. Um, and then there's also some other uh, more localized guidelines. I know Utah or Salt Lake County um, has called for a closure of uh, pools and hot or hot tubs and children pools, um, and and a little more specificity about not using um, the showers and the 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 uh, locker rooms, um, except just for 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 showering, so basically avoiding kind of congregating in there. So again, how do you enforce those things, or, or really responsibly adopt those guidelines without somebody there to to monitor it? And I think that an HOA, if they're sued, would have a hard time arguing that they're doing the responsible thing if they didn't one adopt the the guidelines that have been issued by the state and by local government and two, show that they actually had some kind of system for enforcing them. And I think both of those things are gonna be really difficult for most HOAs to do. So I think when you look at kind of a risk reward analysis, um, you know, the, the risk seems higher than the, the reward to me in, in these situations. Because what is the reward? Uh, you know, and maybe some associations would have a specific circumstance, but I think most associations, it's just an inconvenience to not have your, your pools open. So, so one of the questions is, as we start to open this up, and you touched on it briefly just a second ago, and this kind of goes back to the clubhouse, is as we open up, should associations consider staffing those areas in order to open up, or if they open up without staffing, what sort of the ramifications of that, of those two choices? Yeah, and I think that... Um... I think that if they can staff it, then that puts you in a better position. It certainly makes you know makes it more likely that you can actually follow the guidelines. Um, personally, I would say if you can't staff it, then then you probably you probably shouldn't open. I I, I think staffing solves the problem. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Robert. So I I agree. I think staffing uh, could go a long way to solving these problems because it would allow you to meet the guidelines. And then if you meet the guidelines, I think the chances of, of being found willfully um, to be like willful, to be in willful violation drop, you know, very, very low. Uh, and then the association should be protected under SB 3007. Um, so from a legal perspective, I think that's a, that's a, you know, if you can afford it, I think it's a really good way to try and get around those problems. Um, obviously, from a practical perspective, now you're paying another person. Um, and from a practical perspective, uh, following the guidelines means it's less likely you're going to give people COVID-19, which I think we can all get behind. All right. can, I, can I jump in? Uh, just Scott. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, I've had associations approach me and say, well, what if we have a waiver where people all sign a waiver and, so that they don't care about the guidelines? And... 
and in short, we've recommended against that for a couple of reasons. One is that the assumption is that everybody that enters that pool is signed a waiver and um, and is taking a risk, but that might not be the case. Also, the waivers I've seen try to have the parents waive the claims of the children. And Utah law, uh, there's case law that would suggest that doesn't work very well. Uh, also, if you have grandparents and letting their grandkids go, the grandparents aren't guardians of those children, couldn't send a waiver for them anyway. It just, I think, compounds the problem, gives the appearance of safety to the association, but still leaves the risk um, fairly wide open. Thank you. One last question, Scott. Um, I know Salt Lake County and both Utah County also sent out a specific mandate that says homeowner association pools are not to open. Uh, does that apply to all HOAs or non-condos? This may be a better question for the specific county health departments, but um, what would your response to that be? Um, I, I don't know um, off top, you know, off top of my head. I, I don't. I'd have to look at the specific. I, I had heard that of those those guidelines being issued, and I actually haven't been able to find them. Um, I think if it's, I think that most likely though, um, you know, if we the people writing the guidelines, I think it's reasonable to say maybe they they weren't being nuanced about um, saying, well, there's a difference between a homeowner association and a condominium association. My my initial assumption would be they probably meant all associations, but I'd want to look at the, the specific language more. Maybe somebody else on the panel has, has looked at it. Probably not, but thank you. All right, so we will move on. Well, um, let me, Scott, let me actually finish with, with one, one piece that I think is really important, so I don't want to leave out. Okay. Um, there is some case law. There's some case law out of Florida that, of course, isn't directly applicable here, but I think is, is is informative. Um, 2008, and I'll just go over it really briefly, this was a federal court case where there was an HOA that was sued for a, a, a virus being passed in its pool, and this was a handful of mouth situation. The interesting piece about this and the piece that, that went up on appeal was um, the HOA and the property management company who were both sued, they tendered claims to their insurance. Insurance on appeal said, we don't have to cover this, we have exclusion. And um, the, the federal district court agreed with them, and they said that there's no coverage in this case under the, the pollutant exclusion that, that were, were in the policy. Now, what's interesting about that is that a lot of HOAs, and this is general liability insurance, a lot of HOAs, their general liability policy is going to have a, a virus, you know, vi uh, infectious disease exclusion. So, uh, so already it's pretty clear that the HOA isn't going to get coverage for a lawsuit like this. Um, this specific underwriter um, is Philadelphia, which underwrites a lot of a lot of policies. They didn't, and, and I understand they still don't have an infectious disease exclusion in their general liability policies, but still the court found that there was no coverage because they have a pollutant exclusion. So the bottom line is there's an additional layer of risk, and that is if the HOA gets sued, even if they feel like it's a bad lawsuit and they feel like maybe we can win this, well, there's no insurance coverage, so you're gonna have to you're gonna have to pay for you know possibly two or three years to get through that lawsuit. So again, the risk reward is just a lot of to me a lot of risk for um, for a small reward. Thank you. All right. Um, so we talked about common areas and opening common areas and kind of the standards there. Um, the natural question is assessment collection and past due collections. Um, and so we will move on with Bruce, uh, who will address that for us. Thank you. So let me move down the next slide. Should be able to move down the next slide. There we go. A um, little bit of play on words, maybe. Uh, if the assessments are the lifeblood of the association, they've now been infected with COVID-19 because of the ability to collect is um, is compromised um, and if we're overly aggressive at this time that may backfire you don't want to be on the 10 o'clock news because you uh, threw out some young couple that had jobs at the local restaurant and they don't have employment right now and so they couldn't pay their assessments 
and so you foreclosed on their brand new town home that they were trying to make as their starter home that even though you might legally be able to do that the backlash may be too great for those who have been following legislation this last year we've already had some pushback in the form of sb 183 legislator had a couple of uh, units in various condo and, and townhome projects he disagreed with how management was handling things he chose not to pay his assessments that's probably not the right way to approach resolution but that's what he did and so the association commenced non-judicial foreclosure proceedings and uh, they didn't i guess maybe realize that they were picking with uh, maybe the wrong dog in that fight who had a lot of pull in the legislature so he ran a bill that tried to eliminate non-judicial foreclosures altogether and it took substantial efforts and negotiation uh, multiple trips to the capitol to work out a compromise that allowed us to retain non-judicial foreclosures at all in homeowners associations. Now that that occurred during non-emergency times. That was just pushback from what was perceived to be an overly aggressive association. So now it's even more sensitive times. The national CAI board, so not the Utah board, but the national board for CAI has made the following recommendations. And they, I believe they've made these recommendations because once again, if we don't police ourselves, someone will police us and that will come at a cost and, and not be what we want. So here's the recommendations they make. If an owner can't timely pay, try to get them in a workout payment plan. If there's government assistance available for them, uh, suggest that they apply for it. I know all of us as attorneys that do collections routinely work through payment plans. In my office, we have tried to, even once we've implemented a workout plan, if someone can provide us some, where did I go? Eh, I must have hit a button or someone hit a button and put me in the wrong slide. I can't seem to go down, so can someone do that for me? Robert, maybe? If you can move my slide, Robert, that'd be awesome. There we go. Um, but we've even adjusted a workout plan because they said they fell on even harder times. So we reduced the payment requirement, extended the plan again. Uh, I also do landlord tenant stuff and I find that the COVID-19 defense is coming up all the time in that they'll say, we we'll go to serve eviction papers as an example, and they'll say, oh, someone has the virus in the house. It's not true, but they throw that out. Um, recently, we just sent certified mailing of a notice of lien, and the person who signed for the notice of lien on the signature block signed it COVID-19. So people are sort of playing off of that now, uh, but you need to be careful and maybe be um, a little more lenient and assume that they have a hardship. CAI has recommended that no foreclosures are commenced at least until June 1st or later. Uh, waive fines or fees and penalties if it's causing a hardship. If you have a collection policy, maybe relax that. I've got a slide a little later that I'll show you uh, of what we've suggested to uh, help relax that. The suggestion is that you continue to record your lien to secure your priority interest. In Utah, we already have a bit of a priority, but still there's other reasons um, and, and other liens that might get filed you would lose some priority over. So. Record the lien, but maybe don't move straight into a foreclosure or a lawsuit for collection. Um, and still help everyone understand that without those assessments, 
you're in trouble. Uh, the association has to have those funds. So I'm going to try again to go. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you, I'm sorry, my curse is, uh, okay, there we go. So this is some language we put in one of the letters we send out to the association uh, members when they're in default. And we'll, we'll let them know that they can avoid expenses if they wanna pay. Uh, if it goes through foreclosure, it's more costly. Uh, but we tell them that when it goes into foreclosure, at least non-judicial, they have a period of three months, uh, actually almost four months to cure the debt. But we are letting them know that we will not commence that foreclosure proceeding. We will not move forward with any uh, cure period. We'll extend that cure period for an additional three months from June 30th to give people an opportunity. Again, we don't want to put our associations on the in the paper or on the 10 o'clock news. It's not good for the industry. Yes, the association needs money, but we recommend caution and sensitivity. And, and it would be tough as uh, Scott Lucker has pointed out, you typically have a fiduciary duty, yes, to collect funds, but you also have a duty of care to act in the way an ordinary prudent person would under the circumstances. And these circumstances are unique. We haven't had circumstances like this since 1918. And so uh, to disregard this present pandemic, even if we think it is overblown in its reaction, that might be our personal thought, but that's not the public response. And we need to be more consistent with the public response uh, to avoid liability or pushback. So Bruce, just to finish up here, um, for associations, would you recommend shining a light on um, asking for payment, being proactive to go out to residents and asking them, hey, if you have a trouble, reach out to us proactively, or do you just sort of wait for that response to generate organically from the residents back to the association? Uh, that's a great Great question. Uh, so far, I've just done it organically and wait for someone to respond. Um, I haven't planted in the members' minds that they could utilize um, COVID-19 as a reason to delay payment. However, I have seen other businesses, uh, landlord-tenant is one, where there has been a proactive push to all of their um, clientele to say, if you have a problem, please contact us and we will work with you. So it's, I think it's up to the board, but I wouldn't be opposed at all to a proactive reach out. I think that's a good thing, but so far I've only done it organically if someone complains. Hey, let okay. me just chime in here real quick. I have a, a kind of cautionary tale on that. You just yesterday got an email from a debtor who, who we've only been collecting against this person for couple weeks maybe a few weeks and um they said hey i've reached out to get barred that you guys are collecting against me uh, you know kfl um during during covid19 i have an interview tomorrow and he's interested in hearing my story and, and i'm going to complain about you and about the, the the property management company and our firm and the property management company and the hoa we all feel like and we all kind of when we talked about it, said the same thing hey if, if they would have asked for a payment plan we all would have we all would have been okay with that, but they didn't ask for one. They just went straight to the news. So I'm not necessarily, and I don't know, I don't know where I sit on that. If it's a good idea to, to kind of advertise that we'll get everybody payment plans, but you have the possibility of this sort of thing happening without them really bringing the conversation up first. Scott, that's a, a fair point. The other thing that I was going to say, and so I'm glad you said that it reminded me is um, what do you do about assessments that became due prior to the pandemic? I have uh, at least one debtor who, let's call it a year, hasn't paid assessments. And now he's claiming that because of COVID-19, he can't pay. Um, we've worked out a payment plan with him, but I also did pressure some and say, look, these debts arose prior to any problems you might be claiming came up because of COVID-19. Why didn't you pay back then? 
and because you didn't pay uh, before the pandemic, were a little less tolerant than we might be to someone whose debt arose during the pandemic. Perfect, thank you. So we have a few more topics, so we're going to end up going a little. Yeah. I was uh, just wondering, um, but we are moving on to um, some maintenance, then we'll touch on essential services for the HOA, and then a question about reserves. So those are the three topics that we have left, um, but let's move on to maintenance um, issues, and Robert, um, we'll uh, hand the wheel to you. Okay. So, um, Maintenance and capital improvements. Uh, this, the, the project is clean. You follow Bruce's suggestions on that. Uh, you've collected your assessments. And you're not having to go into someone's unit who's infected with COVID-19 and get it decontaminated. Um, just in general, uh, you know, construction in Utah, as it was in many other states, was listed as a um, essential service. So even during the... Um, the stronger lockdown, even during the, the red guidelines, you can still do construction. Um, and you, you have to follow the requirements. Um, and at this point, I, you know, hopefully we all know what they are, right? No sick or symptomatic employees on job sites, increased hand washing, cleaning, sanitation, um, face coverings, uh, gloves. And so if you're going to be doing, you know, construction or, or maintenance, um, obviously, you want to try and find uh, or follow all those requirements. Um, CAI, let's see, this is my next slide. CAI recommends limiting repair work to essential items only. Um, you know, you, you minimize risk, you minimize uh, contacts between um, individuals and, and, and the maintenance people. Um, can you look at, if you've signed contracts that, you know, that already exist, um, can you put them off? Uh, is there is there going to be a, a, a penalty for deferring that maintenance? You know, under all of the guidelines that we've discussed, meeting your fiduciary duties as board members, it could be okay, right? You don't have to take the cheapest bid, and it can be okay to incur some cost to put off construction until it's safer to do so, um, or until you know your project is not filled with people all day since so many people are still at home. Um, and I think it's worth considering, again, under our, under the uh, doctrines of you know, meeting your duty of care, meeting your fiduciary duties, what projects are more risky than others? What projects require people to come into closer contact with each other? Um, you know, if you're washing windows, it's not really a maintenance item, but you're outside the building, um, there's really not much contact going on, and, and it's outside anyway, so it's in the sun, which we know does some disinfectant, uh, or has, dis disinfects the material somewhat. Um, and so that is a much lower risk, and I think you can move forward on it much more uh, safely. Um, and, and just in terms of other, you know, other projects, the one thing somebody actually asked me, uh, so I went, went too far, you know, they thought that they could get a great deal now on some construction uh, because the economy has been wrecked and, and um, now will be the time to do that. And I think you would evaluate it under the same rubric. Um, what project are you talking about? How safe is it? Um, how much is it going to cost? Uh, and and um, is it, you know, is there really going to be savings to do it now? My sense is that construction hasn't really slowed down very much, but um, I'm probably uh, not in a good place to to opine on that. Um, so I don't have too much more on this. I mean, I think the important thing is to follow the guidelines. As I talked about, those guidelines have the force of law. Um, and yes, you should be protected, you being the HOA and you being the manager as the agent of the HOA, if somebody gets sick under SB 3007 um, from a claim, you know, that I got sick from COVID because you weren't following the rules, unless you really aren't following the rules, in which case uh, I don't know that that uh, statute will protect you and, and, and the, the manager who was 
organizing the uh, construction or the HOA or both could be sued. And as Scott pointed out, you may not even have insurance coverage. Um, and so I do think to the extent you haven't looked at, you know, the, the rules, I know in Summit County, uh, we have our own special order, and that order is 60 pages long. So, you know, if you're if you're working in Summit County, you really need to look at that order. Uh, it's very detailed. It has very specific requirements for all kinds of things: um, hotel accommodations, construction, pools, gyms, spas. Um, they all have their own section. And I, you know, to the extent you can't meet the requirements or the recommendations of that rule or in other jurisdictions where they're just following the, um, the governor's statewide rules. Uh, I, I, you know, I think it's, um, you should think twice before moving forward um, if, you, if you can't meet the requirements. Because I think it, it opens up everybody to liability um, if somebody gets sick. And uh, I you know that the statute, I just don't think it's, I, I suspect that the legislature really was trying to immunize people from these claims, uh, but I just don't think they succeeded as well as they thought they did. So unless you have any questions, that's that's all I have on that topic. Uh, we will we'll circle back um, on some of those. Uh, there was a question, in Summit County, it's recommended to wait 48 hours before cleaning a unit that's been vacated. Uh, in the case of fractional ownership where one owner ends weeks and begins on a timeshare situation, what is, would your recommendation uh, be there for cleaning and disinfecting and that sort of thing? Um, my recommendation would be to meet the county guidelines. Uh, and, you know, we'd have to adopt a rule. Oh, and I should mention, um, because I was talking to somebody about this, uh, in terms of adopting rules, you know, we all know the HOA uh, statute, as opposed to the condo statute, has a rule-making section that's a little bit cumbersome, requires notice, and all kinds of other things. And there's an exception to that, which is emergencies, basically. And so um, even in uh, a homeowners association, as opposed to a condo, you need to adopt rules, rules on social distancing, uh, rules on um, if it's a hotel project or it looks like a hotel, what goes on in the lobby, or rules on specifically to this question that, um, you know, if it's a fractional ownership and uh, you get, let's say it's a week, you know, without looking at the documents, I guess I'd want to look at them, but my inclination would be to say, we're going to adopt a rule that says everyone has to chop a day off their week so we can clean in accordance with county requirements because otherwise the whole the whole building could be shut down. Um, I do think Summit County, I've also read in the park record that Summit County has basically taken every inspector of everything, building inspectors, I mean, code, and they turned them into health department inspectors. And they're all going to be going out and looking to see if, uh, for instance, in Summit County, uh, I don't know if this is in the phase guidelines. You have to keep a daily log of asking employees whether they are sick or are showing any symptoms. And that log must be available for inspection at any time by the health department. So what what I've read is that they that they intend to try to enforce that and that they're going to be in, inspecting everybody. Um, and so, again, without looking at the documents and Knowing the specifics, um, I would say, you know, you need to follow the guidelines, which means we're going to have to adopt a rule or something that tells people they're going to lose a day off their week so we can have 48 hours to clean the unit. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, Bruce, I think that leads perfectly into our, uh, our next topic here. It does. It's a good segue. So uh, let me just go back one slide again. Sorry. The question of essential services might be different between whether it's essential to the association or essential to the owner. And although this is not a fair housing question, I think it might be useful to look at it in a similar context. If someone has a disability, they need a reasonable accommodation. So if someone is sick with COVID-19, accommodations might need to be made 
or if someone is um, staying safe at home because of the the pandemic, they might also need a reasonable accommodation. So let's go down to a couple of specifics. Should you be restricting guests and vendors? Uh, this is even more critical in high rise buildings because of the air conditioning system is typically circulating through the whole building, much closer contact, but it's recommended that the board with the assistance of their attorney develop some visitor policies, a temporary visitor policy. And you might list who's essential and who's not essential. Obviously, if you're performing an essential repair like Robert was talking about, then you are an essential visitor, plumbing, air conditioning, medical aids, healthcare workers, those are essential. Make a policy that allows for their uh, for them being there. Uh, for non-essential vendors, a realtor, they might not need to be bringing people into the unit for a showing. They might need to be there to take pictures initially so that they can have a virtual showing, but they don't need to run traffic in and out uh, day in and day out to show a place. Is the improvement one, and, it, and this kind of goes along with what Robert was talking about, does an, a homeowner want some improvement done that does not affect their safety? Well, that might not be essential at the time being, even if they can get it at a cheaper price. If there's some just nice interior or exterior remodeling that they might want to do, that might not be reason to bring workers into particularly a confined area in a high rise. Additional housekeepers. Um, just because I want a maid to come in and clean my place doesn't mean that that's essential. Now, it might be essential if someone is ill or if someone really has uh, the need and you need to make that accommodation, but that's something you need to, to be thinking about. If you're going to grant access, what sort of concerns uh, should you have? Should you be questioning them? Are you following these policies? Are you following the state guidelines? Uh, I would suggest that you question your contractors about their compliance. If you happen to have a guest or visitor suite, you might not want to be opening that up for use. I'm going to drop down to that last one. Some locations, short-term rentals have been prohibited. The state of Florida, as an example, they were finding that uh, when the people, when states in the Northeast issued a stay at home, work at home order, those people thought, hey, I can stay at home at a and b in Florida. I will self-quarantine in Florida. And so they were having an influx of people from other, outside their area into their area, and they were concerned about that. So they prohibited any future short-term rentals for the time being. Whether you should consider that uh, for your own community, most communities don't like short-term rentals anyway, but the concept is, are people coming from outside your area into your area and could they be infecting your community and is there anything you can do to act reasonably to limit that? So again, some more essential services, if there's a water leak, let people in. If someone's elderly and they need some health care or some cleaning services, let them in. But question the people before they come in. Again, screening the outside vendors do they have proper protective gear if you're going to come into our place do you wear masks do you use gloves are you using disinfectant are you following the cdc's guidelines um your request for bids might include some of this information that you didn't think of before okay that was uh my summary on the essential services. Uh, any questions, Scott Anderson? No, I think uh, I think we've covered it. You know, I think it, the the question really has come down, and we've touched on it a couple times. Is is using caution and using the um, trying to weigh that liability. But I think it does it uh, as a segue into um, our last topic, accessing reserves. That does segue in as 
we talked about collections and as collections rise, you know, we still have maintenance stuff going on. So um, naturally, can we use reserves to do operating expenses? Most of us know that that is not um, advisable, but um, Scott, why don't you uh, walk us through that? Yeah, and, and this is gonna be pretty short because I think the answer is pretty straightforward. Um, so again, uh, let's look at state statute and it's we have state statute right on point. Um, I, I've referenced the condo statute here, but there's also one under um, the, the Community Association Act. And um, you know the language, I quoted it exactly, but the language essentially says that you need to have a, a majority view, a vote from your homeowners to use reserve funds for anything other than daily maintenance expenses um, or for any purpose other than the purpose for which the, the reserve fund was established. That, that number two there has always been a little bit funny to me because it's because of the vagueness of it. But um, but I think the, the underlying message is um, you have to have specific homeowner approval by a vote, by a majority vote, um, to use reserve funds. And it's not just kind of a general approval to use them however they want, but, but the way the statute's written, it, it, it seems to be saying that they have to be voting to use it for a specific, in a specific way. And unless you have that majority approval, then, then I don't see any authority under the law that you can do that. I, I understand, um, I, mean, I know that our LAC, uh, there were some efforts to to get an exception to that during the special uh, legislative session, and, and um, I, I don't think that that was really received well by the legislature. They They didn't haven't granted that. I don't think there's been any um, progress on that since, but as the, cost, as the law reads right now, then there, there really isn't um, any legal authority to use your reserve funds for, for anything other than reserve purposes. Bruce, do you want to speak to what the LAC was trying to do? Yeah, and, and I'll give some credit where I think credit's due. Uh, Michael Johnson with SES, um, sort of, well, I think was forward thinking and suggested that during a pandemic, this one or any pandemic, if the governor issues orders uh, that there is a pandemic that the association boards should be able to access reserve funds during only during the pandemic time uh, to meet their daily obligations or maintenance expenses and other things. Uh, I think it's a great idea. Uh, yeah, I know some people might fudge this and get around it by saying, okay, well, we're just not funding reserves right now, as opposed to taking money from reserves. We just aren't funding reserves and the money that would have got in, in the reserve, we're not putting in the reserve because we're using it for daily expenses. Uh, so there's a way maybe to uh, get around the actual taking the money from the reserve as opposed to not putting into the reserve in the first place but that's still a budgeting issue. I, again, I think the concept was great. Uh, frankly, we we floated it past realtors and developers and uh, they'll, they'll probably be upset for me saying this, but it's, it's what they said. I, I'm disappointed in the response. The response is, no, we think the statute is fine just the way it is and you should budget for these things so that you can prepare for the unexpected and you should have sufficient operating funds to do this so you don't dip into reserves. Uh, I'm not sure when the last time was someone could foresee in their budget a pandemic to be able to budget for that. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, the real, probably the real fear or worry is that uh, developers have been concerned and they've stated openly concerned that they don't want reserve funds used to fund a lawsuit against them. So I think it's, more of a cautionary measure that they're reacting a, a bit defensively at this point than uh, maybe supporting this idea during a pandemic. We'll still try to push to see if we can't get something done at the special session or later time with this because I, I really think that the boards should be able to adopt a rule during a pandemic to access at least some level or some percentage of the reserve funds to help out. Because otherwise, if people can't pay, it doesn't mean that the uh, the people that the association have obligations to are going to be kind and forgive the association. They're not. The association is going to have to pay at some point. So, 
Yeah, I know we um, we have had conversations that maybe we suspend um, reserve contributions um, during this time to kind of allow us to free up some operating funds that may be an option as you pointed out of not putting in there but um putting money into the reserve account but thank you um all right so we're going to open it up to some questions if you still have some questions here um we will open it up for some questions and circle back to some ones that um i think need to be answered um for the panelists, we'll start with Scott and then move to Robert then to Bruce. Um, the question came from about social gatherings. A lot of HOAs have scheduled some spring summer socials and as they've sort of moved through the guidelines, they have canceled that and residents have um, become upset, understandably, because they look forward to that. Um, what uh, should the HOA not be holding gatherings and what would your response to those owners be? Scott Walker. Um, for me, first thing would be similar to what we said about the pools and, and you know other facilities. I think depending on their ability to to actually enforce, I mean, first of all, guidelines should be adopted. I think there should be a resolution that here's what our standards are in the community and we're following the you know government um, issued mandates and guidelines. Um, but more than just adopting that, I think that there, there needs to be a mechanism for, for enforcing it in a meaningful way. And I think that depending on their ability and willingness to do that, um, you know, if, they, if they're if they not willing or don't have the ability to do that, then yeah, I think they probably shouldn't be having those gatherings. Um, I think if they feel like they can they can do that, then, then maybe, you know, there, there is, there's still some risk there, obviously. But, but I think if you feel like you can enforce those guidelines. I mean, I, I do want to say, I, I, I don't want to be um, alarmist. Um, and, you know, I, I do think that these kind of lawsuits, suing an HOA for, for, for contracting an infectious disease, um, I think there's a lot of uphill battles for a homeowner who's trying to bring a lawsuit like that. Um, so I, I don't want to pretend like it's, it's something, you know, more than it is, but, but it is a realistic risk that those lawsuits can come. And again, with no insurance coverage, that, that makes it undesirable what win or lose. Um, so I, I would I would take kind of the conservative approach and say if if we can't really enforce any guidelines meaningfully, then it's just not worth the risk. Robert, I I just I don't see how you can you can do that right now. You know, I was trying to think of some way could you could you um, could you cater it and let people come pick it up and I I can't but I can't think of a way. Um, you can meet the guidelines and and have a, a big social event. Um, unless you know, at my synagogue we have Zoom services, and then we have a, a Zoom uh, sort of meet and greet. But it you know with 60 people on a Zoom call, it's not very effective. Um, so you know you could, yeah. I I agree with Scott. I I just can't think of a way to really do it, or a way to do it effectively. Um, I'd also worry about being on the news for the homeowners association that got a bunch of people sick um, because you know you had a big party you couldn't put off your summer party um, that wouldn't be very good for real estate values so I don't know maybe Bruce has a genius idea I, I can't think of a way to do it now, my, my idea is not too genius it's kind of ironic though that um, I really I don't watch TV. I don't even have TV in my house. I mean, my wife watches some, and I don't watch a lot of movies. But in the last week, I have watched The Colony and World War Z, which are about <laughs> pandemics and, and viruses and uh, sort of those extreme things. So uh, Hollywood was on to this way before this pandemic. But you, you kind of see how people start to freak out uh, when a pandemic is here, and you look to that extreme and uh, and ultimately, how do you, as an association, justify taking a position different than what the governor has provided? I, how do you defend against that? You might disagree with it. It might be wrong. But do you want to be the person to try to tell the governor he was wrong and you were right, and then someone gets sick? It just It's just too hard to justify. 
Perfect. Thank you. Um, all right. So it doesn't look like um, any more questions have come in. Um, so if you want, we can give you a, a you know 30 seconds to wrap up your thoughts, give us some last parting shots, and then um, we will uh, call it a day. Scott? Um, sure. I, I don't have much, much more to add than what's been said. Um, I, I do agree with what Bruce just said. I think that's, that summed it up well, summed up my feelings on it well. Whether or not we agree with with the, the governor's positions or, or local or federal guidelines that have been issued or mandates that have been issued, um, I, I think the bottom line is it's going to be hard to defend against that. If, if you are sued and, you, and you're not following those guidelines, that, that's going to put you in a really bad position. So I, I would say be conservative, be cautious with all of this. Thank you. Robert? Um, I would add that if you haven't looked at the phase guidelines for, you know, uh, gyms or hotel accommodations or what have you, you need to go to the governor's website or the state of Utah's website and look at them. And you also need to be aware of the fact that some jurisdictions like Summit County have adopted stricter guidelines uh, with the approval of the governor. Um, and that, you know, those are, in, in every respect I've seen, they are more strict than the phase guidelines. Um, I practice mostly in Summit and Wasatch with a little bit in Salt Lake. So I'm not, I haven't looked at other counties, but, um, you know, it, it's something that, it, you know, I want to make sure that there aren't even more strict guidelines in place uh, on top of the phase guidelines. Perfect. Bruce? I agree with what both uh, Scott uh, Welker and Robert have said, and I would just say be patient with your complaining members. They will complain. They want to get out. It is a problem to be cooped up. People we're made to socialize. Um, the social distancing isn't too bad for me because I tell my wife I love people. I really do. I just like them in small doses. So <laughs> uh, I, I'm not looking forward to big crowds. But um, just be prudent. Again, act according to what the public guidelines are versus your own personal thoughts. Thank you. So I will say that we are, um, thank you for the panelists. I think it was very informative. The chapter will be putting the uh, PowerPoint and this recording up on the new website. Uh, if you have not visited it that yet, please do so. Um, and so it will be accessible for those that have registered. Um, with no more questions, thank you all for participating. And uh, I think for the most part, the chapter's first webinar went off. And we will look forward to uh, seeing you all in June. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Scott.